The house is small, but cozy. When the realtor showed it to her, she couldn't help but notice all the flaws. The chipped paint on the door frame, the missing shingles on the roof, the cracks along the kitchen walls, even the dented old mailbox out front. But even with all those imperfections, she can't help but feel this little house is calling to her. It's where she's meant to be. This will be a home for her. The woman knows, deep in her heart, that this is what she needs to start over. It's not easy. As she moves her things into the new house, she can't help but think about her failed relationship. Every piece of furniture, every knick-knack, reminds her of her old girlfriend. She unloads a heavy box from the back of her car, but she trips over the curb as she turns toward the house. She falls, and the contents of the box spill all over the sidewalk. Their old photo albums. She quickly shoves them back into the box, doing her best to avoid looking at them. But one photo, an old vacation snapshot of her and her girlfriend visiting Niagara Falls, catches her eye as it falls out of an album. She bites her lip and wills herself not to tear up as she pushes it back into the box. How can two people who were once so close grow so far apart? The rest of the day passes in a haze. There's lots to do, what with arranging the furniture and calling up all the utilities. By the end of the day, she's exhausted and thankful to fall into bed. As she gradually drifts off to sleep, she muses on her situation. Today was the hardest day, she tells herself. Every day is only going to get easier from here on out. Time heals all wounds. The next day, she rises early. The sun is shining, birds are chirping. As she walks into her new kitchen to brew a pot of coffee, she's overcome with a sudden surge of good feelings. This house has so much potential. She could learn to live here. She could find a new love here. The world is her oyster, and she's ready for anything. Yes, she tells herself, all I needed was a good night's sleep. Now, she feels totally revitalized. A little while later, she hears the mail truck arrive and depart. Looking out the window, she sees that the delivery person has shoved the little aluminum flag into the upright position, indicating that she has mail. She ties her bathrobe around her waist and, still cradling a mug of steaming coffee in her hands, walks to that battered black mailbox at the end of the walkway. That's the first thing that ought to go, she mumbles to herself as she imagines all her plans to redecorate the house. Maybe she'll get one of those fun mailboxes that come in the shape of a wacky animal or a birdhouse. Something different, something eye-catching. Her old girlfriend never let her do anything fun. She pulls open the mailbox and pulls out a stack of envelopes. Still thinking about the possibilities for a new mailbox, she quickly shuffles through the letters, scanning the return addresses with little interest. It's mostly junk mail. That's no surprise. She just moved in, so most of her friends don't know her new address yet. But there's one letter at the bottom of the pile that has no return address. Huh, that's weird, she says. It's probably just more junk mail. She knows that some advertisers don't leave return addresses as a way to pique a recipient's interest and trick them into reading their sales pitches. Nevertheless, she's intrigued enough to tear it open. To her surprise, inside is a handwritten letter. Hello, says the letter. I couldn't help but notice you today. I'm really excited to see a new face in the neighborhood. I hope you enjoy your stay here. Maybe we could meet later? See ya! The woman blinks in confusion. This must be a welcome letter from one of her new neighbors, but since it's not signed, she really has no way of knowing which one. It's a little odd, but, well, she's sure that the letter writer must have had good intentions. She pushes the red aluminum flag back into its reclining position, folds the mysterious letter under her arm with her other mail, and retreats back into her new house. Imagine her surprise when, the next day, she finds another letter in her mailbox. Hi again, it says. I saw that you read my letter yesterday. I'm so glad. I was afraid that you wouldn't like me, but now I see that we're going to be great friends. Maybe you'd like to get coffee together sometime? XOXO. P.S. I really like you. Okay, now this is getting a little pushy. That first letter was friendly, if a little awkward, but this one almost sounds like someone is trying to solicit her for a date. She's in no mood for that. Even if she wasn't still hurting from her breakup, she didn't know this mysterious letter writer. Where did they get the nerve to ask her out? Angrily, she crumples up the new letter and throws it directly into the trash. She looks across the hedge, peering into the neighbor's yards. In the yard to her left, a middle-aged man pushes a lawnmower across the grass. In the yard to her right, two old women are gossiping at the fence. She feels suddenly exposed as she realizes that the letters could be coming from anyone in the neighborhood. She hopes that maybe if she ignores it, 
the message will be clear. She quickly scurries back into her house and slams the door shut. The next morning, she finds another message from her secret admirer together with her other mail. The tone of the letter is more desperate, more wheedling. I saw you throw away my letter yesterday, it says. Why did you do that? Don't you like me? I really thought we would make a great couple. Maybe if you gave me a chance, I could make you so much happier than your ex. The woman doesn't read any farther. She throws the letter to the ground. This is going too far. It was bad enough that a stranger was hitting on her, but now she knows that her secret admirer is a stalker too. How else would they know that she threw away their previous letter unless they were watching her as she picked up her mail? And, even more disturbing, how could they possibly know that she had troubles with her ex? She stalks over to the house next door and pounds on the door. When the middle-aged man answers, she confronts him with a letter. Did you write this? What's your problem? She demands as she shoves the paper in his face. I don't know what you're trying to do, but I'm not interested. I want you to keep away from me. I don't know what you're talking about, protests the man, holding up his hands in surrender. I, I didn't write anything. The woman doesn't know if she believes him, but she has to admit that the middle-aged man sounds genuinely confused by her accusations. Maybe he's not the culprit. But when she confronts the neighbor living to the other side, she hears a similar story. Are you sending me these letters because they're actually really creepy? I don't like people watching me, says the woman as she confronts her other neighbor. The old woman just shakes her head. Mercy me, I didn't send you a letter. Why would I do that? I could just come over and talk to you. I don't know why you youngsters are always making up stories about weird letters. The young woman wonders about the old woman's final words when she's eating dinner alone in her kitchen later that night. The way that she complained about young people always making up stories about weird letters makes her wonder if this has happened before. Could it be that other young women have lived in this house before her? And were they victims of the same stalker? But who could this stalker be? It's got to be someone close. She can just feel it. At that moment, she looks up from her meal and gasps in surprise. There, right outside her window, is the black mailbox. It's hovering right at the edge of the window, as if it's shyly peeking in, like a bashful caller afraid of being seen. The young woman blinks and rubs her eyes. When she looks again, the mailbox is gone. She rushes to the door and throws it open. The mailbox is right there, standing at the curb at the end of the footpath, just as it's always been. Are her eyes playing tricks on her? Is the stress of her breakup and the mysterious stalker finally getting to her? The next day, she finds another letter. Her stalker is getting even more unhinged, and the messages are becoming downright crazy. The next day, she finds not just one letter in her mailbox, but two. Both messages sound absolutely deranged. Her stalker, and at this point there's no doubt in her mind that a stalker is responsible for these letters, has resorted to threats. Why don't you like me? You'd better change your attitude if you know what's good for you. You think you're too good for me? What does your ex have that I don't? Maybe you need a real man to really show you the ropes. She crushes the letters in her hands, her face flushing with a combination of fear and rage. Who does this person think that they are? She can't take this pressure much longer. She's ready to report these letters to the police, but she still has no idea who's stalking her. Or does she? She can't help but think about that strange incident the previous night, when she thought that she saw the mailbox standing right outside the window. But that's crazy, isn't it? Her mailbox can't be stalking her, can it? If she tries to tell anyone that her mailbox is sending her threatening messages, everyone is just going to think that she's crazy. But soon, things start to get worse, escalating in ways that force the woman to confront that possibility. That night, she's in her kitchen fixing dinner. She turns from the stove to grab some condiments from the pantry. That's when she sees it. The mailbox. It's not outside this time, it's in the next room. It's standing partially hidden behind the door, again as if it's trying not to be seen. She drops her work and rushes out into the living room, hoping to catch the mailbox in the act. But it's gone. She runs to the window and, once again, sees the mailbox standing at the end of the walkway in the exact same spot that it should be. She's certain that she can't be imagining these things, but at the same time, what other explanation could there be? She barely gets any sleep that night, tossing and turning with unpleasant dreams. Several times she startles awake, sitting bolt upright in bed, half convinced that the sinister mailbox might even be in the same room with her, watching her as she sleeps. The next day, the exhausted woman rises early from restless dreams and sits on the front porch, waiting for the mail truck to arrive. When the familiar U.S. Postal Service vehicle pulls up to the curb, she stalks over and confronts the mailman. Come on, hand it over, she demands. It's my mail, give it to me. 
She's too flustered by this whole absurd scenario to bother being polite, and the mailman is in no mood to argue. This woman looks positively insane, he thinks. Her hair is disheveled, her eyes are ringed with heavy black circles, and she looks like she hasn't had a decent night's sleep in weeks. He has to deal with all kinds of crazy customers every day, and he knows better than to push his luck. He shoves the bundle of letters into her arms and jumps back into his truck. The woman quickly shuffles through the stack of letters, scanning the return addresses and throwing each envelope to the ground behind her when she's satisfied that it's not from her stalker. Just as she thought, none of these letters match the description of the blank envelopes that her stalker uses for his messages. She pulls open the mailbox and looks inside. To her horror, there's already a letter inside. She grabs it and feels the blood drain from her face as she looks at the blank envelope. It's another message from her stalker. Now she knows that he's sending the letters through the mail, but how did he get this letter into the mailbox without her seeing him? She woke up so early this morning, even before the sun was up, and she's been watching the mailbox for hours. It doesn't make sense that any of her neighbors could have planted this message without her knowing, but the only other possible explanation is that the mailbox itself is somehow writing these letters. She stares at the black aluminum box, the dark, dented metal suddenly taking on a sinister aspect in the early morning sunlight. Maybe she really is going insane. Maybe she just misses her ex-girlfriend so much that she's imagining all this madness and just projecting her fear of being alone onto this mailbox. No, no, she doesn't believe that at all. She's going to put a stop to this, once and for all. The woman jogs into her garage and returns several moments later with a shovel. She doesn't know whether she's hallucinating or not, but she's had just about enough of this stupid mailbox. She wants it out of her life. Even if it's not stalking her, even if this is all in her mind, it's clear that there's something off about this mailbox, something that's putting her ill at ease. She starts to shovel dirt away from the base of the mailbox post, grunting and sweating with the exertion of her work, but not stopping until the post is loose. She grabs at the thick wooden post and hoists the mailbox, post and all, out of its pit. She drags it across the lawn to her driveway, where, with considerable effort, she manages to shove it into the back seat of her car, ripping the upholstery of the seats and spilling wet dirt all over the floor. She doesn't care about the damage to her car. She just needs to get rid of this mailbox. A chill runs down her spine at the thought of taking a long car ride with that thing behind her. She doesn't trust it at all, and the idea of turning her back on it. Well, she doesn't know what kind of danger she'll be in. As she climbs into the driver's seat, she adjusts the rearview mirror so that she can keep an eye on the mailbox for the whole trip. To her immense relief, it doesn't move once on the whole car ride, even though her nervous eyes keep flicking to the rearview mirror to assuage her fears. She finally arrives at her destination, the city dump. She pulls up to the front gate and honks her horn until the custodian comes out of the guardhouse. She motions for him to remove the mailbox from her back seat, and a panicked expression on her face tells him that he should be quick about it. He's barely pulled the mailbox clear the door when the woman peels away, skidding along the curb and gunning the engine to drive away from the dump and the abandoned mailbox as fast as possible. After a few minutes on the road, she starts to calm down. She breathes a deep sigh of relief, a new sense of calm finally settling over her now that she's removed that awful mailbox from her life. She adjusts the rearview mirror to look at her reflection, wincing at the sight of her haggard eyes and blotchy skin. The stress of the last few days must have been really getting to her, but now she feels like she can finally move on with her life. She manages a tense chuckle at the memory. The whole idea that her mailbox was stalking her seems increasingly absurd the further she drives from the dump, but she can't help but feel much better. But when she turns the corner to arrive at her home street, she sees something that she cannot believe. Her eyes bulge from her head, and her fingers tighten around the steering wheel, her knuckles going white. It can't be. The mailbox is back. The same black aluminum box and wooden post. Of course, after all she's been through, she would recognize it anywhere. It's still there, in her front yard, at the end of the walkway. But she's certain that she just dropped it off the dump, right? There's no way that she could have imagined digging up the mailbox and lugging it all the way to the junkyard. Could it be possible that the mailbox somehow followed her home? Could it be that desperate for her attention and companionship? The woman doesn't say a word. She keeps driving, passing her new home without stopping. She can't deal with this anymore. She glances at the rearview mirror, one last look at the cozy little house where she thought that she could start a new life. But she can't live like this. She keeps driving, and she doesn't look back. On the corner, the mailbox stands still and silent, as if it had never moved and never will.
Dealing with a stalker can be a frightening and dangerous situation, but it can be even worse when your stalker isn't even human. That woman never had to see the mailbox again after she left the property, but the SCP Foundation is very familiar with this dangerously obsessive romantic, which it calls SCP-1269. SCP-1269 looks like a perfectly ordinary mailbox situated in front of a perfectly ordinary house somewhere in Massachusetts. It is made of black aluminum, possessing a red flag and a white plastic post. It stands at a third of a meter tall, and the house number of the corresponding property is printed on its side. It is unknown how long SCP-1269 has resided at the property, although dents and bruises on the mailbox chassis indicate that it's probably been there for some time. SCP-1269 remains a perfectly ordinary mailbox when its corresponding house is unoccupied or else occupied by a male resident. But when a woman, aged 23 years old or older, takes up residence on the property, SCP-1269 will start to manifest its anomalous properties. About two weeks after the woman moves into the house, SCP-1269 will start to manifest unaddressed romantic letters targeted towards the resident of the house. Surveillance within SCP-1269 has shown that the letters manifest approximately three seconds after mail delivery. SCP-1269's anomalous properties will manifest only when a single female, 23 years or older, hereafter referred to as the occupant, resides within the same property as SCP-1269. Approximately two weeks after the occupant moves in, SCP-1269 will start to manifest unaddressed letters every four days. The contents of the letter are romantic in nature and are targeted towards the occupant of the house. Surveillance within SCP-1269 has shown the letters manifest approximately three seconds after the occupant's mail has been delivered. At first, letters will manifest once every four days, but SCP-1269 will quickly escalate its obsessive behavior to the point that multiple letters will appear daily. The letters will become more obsessive and less coherent as SCP-1269's stalking behavior intensifies. When not under direct supervision of the house occupant, SCP-1269 will teleport to a location near the occupant and face them as if it's trying to watch them. It will always manifest in an area where it is partially obstructed, such as peeking through a window or behind some shower curtains. Sometimes, when the resident is asleep, SCP-1269 will teleport near the occupant without obstruction. SCP-1269 will not follow the occupant off the property, and all anomalous properties will cease manifesting if the occupant moves out of the house. Attempts to remove SCP-1269 from its location have so far been unsuccessful. SCP-1269 will teleport to its original curbside location after one hour of relocation. If attempts are made to replace SCP-1269 with a new mailbox, the mailbox will be teleported away with SCP-1269 appearing in its place. Approximately three hours after the disappearance of the new mailbox, it will reappear in a dumpster several kilometers away. Mailboxes recovered so far have all been found in varying amounts of disrepair within garbage bags and covered in obscene graffiti, as if SCP-1269 has become violently jealous of any other mailbox it sees as trying to replace it. SCP-1269 has also shown similar violent jealousy toward humans that it might believe are vying for the affection of any woman living in its house. In a recent experiment, a D-class male was moved onto the property with a then-current test occupant, a D-class female after seven weeks of residence. Interestingly, SCP-1269 ceased its teleporting activity in response to this male presence, but three days later, the D-class male disappeared from the property, causing SCP-1269 to resume all anomalous behavior. Two weeks later, the body of the missing D-class male was discovered in the same dumpster where SCP-1269 had previously disposed of rival mailboxes. The property where SCP-1269 is located is to remain under the custody of the Foundation, with one male researcher residing in the house to monitor the behavior of SCP-1269. Because of the dangerous lengths to which it will go to attain the current object of its affection, SCP-1269 has been designated with Object Class Euclid. It's our job to make sure it doesn't menace anyone else. If you want to support our important mission, while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like House of Human Puppets, SCP-1098-RU, for another tale of a house that'll never be a home.
and make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.